Welcome to Electron Online, and now we're continuing with our quest to understand the diverse electric field being equal to the charge density divided by epsilon sub naught, which is the equation that represents Gauss's law in differential form. And so, so far we understood that we can interpret the divergence of electric field in terms of how fast, not how fast, but how the electric field is changing as a function of position. We've also learned in the previous video that we can think of the diverse electric field as being equal to the difference in the flux going into a volume and out of a volume divided by the size of that volume. And we found that that was exactly, we got the exact same result as we did for the equation where we simply took the partial derivative with respect to x, y, and z. In this case, y and z had no derivatives because the zero, the y component, the z component was zero. And I'll continue to do that to make things a little bit easier. But now we're going to see something a little bit different. Here we have an equation that represents the electric fields as a function of position, but it's no longer a linear equation. It's a quadratic equation. It depends on the position squared. So what does that do to our initial assumption again, where we can say that the diversion electric field is equal to the flux out minus the flux in divided by the volume. And so to compare that, I came up with two different volumes. One volume that is one meter by one meter by one meter. So it's a meter cubed. And we put the corner at the origin of our x, y, z coordinate system. And here we have a second volume that is two meters by two meters by two meters, which means it's eight meters cubed. But again, we put the corner at the origin right there. Now, we're going to go ahead and find the delta, not the delta E, but the divergence of the electric field in both volumes and see if they're different or not. And I have a, an inkling that they are going to be different. And I will interpret how we need to then deal with that. First of all, based upon the equation, when x is equal to 0, you can see the electric field is equal to 10, that would be volts per meter. So at the origin right here, it's 10 volts per meter, and it would be 10 volts per meter for the big cube as well. But one meter away, the, the electric field will be weaker because when x equals 1, 1 squared is still 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 10 minus 2 is 8. So one meter away from the origin, the electric field string will be 8 volts per meter. And two meters away, if we put a two in there, two squared is four, four times two is eight, 10 minus eight is two. The electric field strength at this point would only be two volts per meter. So let's calculate the diversion of V in terms of the flux out minus the flux in divided by the volume for the two volumes. So in the first case, how much flux is coming out of this box? Well, again, the electric flux can be calculated as the electric field strength times the area. So on the flux coming out of the box, it'll be 8 volts per meter, that's electric field strength at this surface, times 1 square meter, which is 8 volt meters. 8 volt times meters minus the flux going in. Well, the flux going in is the electric field strength times the area. So 10 volts per meter times 1 meter squared is 10 volt meters Come going into the cube. 10 volt times meters divided by the volume, and this is one cubic meter, so one meters cubed, and so the result is 8 minus 10, that's minus 2 volts per meter squared. So it would be minus 2 volts per meter squared. That would be what we call the divergence of E for this volume right there. Now if we do it for this volume, let's see what we get. So the delta uh, not the delta, I keep saying delta, but the diversion of the electric field is equal to the flux out minus the flux in divided by the volume. And you may say, why in the world is he doing that? Well, because I really want you to understand what we mean by the divergence of an electric field. All right, so flux out coming out of the box. Notice that at this point, the electric field strength is only 2 volts per meter. And the surface, since it's 2 meters by 2 meters, is 4 meters squared. So 4 times 2 is 8 volt times meters coming out. So 8 volt times meters, that's the flux at the, the side where the flux, the electric field is emanating from. The flux going in, well, that would be 10 volts per meter times 4 meters squared, which is 40 volt meters, so minus 40 volt meters, and we divide that by the volume, now of course the volume here is much bigger, it's 2 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters, which is 8 cubic meters, so 8 meters cubed, and so the result of that would be minus 32 divided by 8, which is minus 4 volt divided by meters squared. Notice we get a different result, just kind of what I was expecting. So what does that mean for us? 
Does that mean that the divergence theorem doesn't work? Does that mean that when you take the divergent electric field, we don't get the same result, even though the field is the exact same thing, because it's the exact same field? Well, remember, the divergence electric field gives you the change of the electric field at a particular location. And if the field doesn't change linearly, but non-linearly, then we have a problem when we make a box that's really big. So what it actually comes down to is when we take the divergence of an electric field, and we try to use that in this particular differential equation of the Gauss's law, we need to take a volume that's infinitesimally small. It's kind of the same principle. Let's say that we have the slope of an equation. Let's say that the equation looks like this, and we want to know what the slope of that equation is. Well, if we take the slope over here, or we take the slope over there, we'll get a different slope. And if you want to take the average slope between those two points, and we draw a line like that, you can see that the average slope does not match the slope along this curve right there. So what do we do to find the slope exactly equal to what it is at a particular point? Well, we bring the two points really close together, and we take the average slope when the two points are infinitesimally close together. Then we get the exact slope. Well, in the very same way here, when we take the divergence of an electric field, in order to get the right value, what, do, what must we do? We must make the volume infinitesimally small. So we need to make the volume really tiny like this and put it anywhere you like. So you want to put the volume over there, you want to put the volume down here. It doesn't matter where you put the volume, as long as it's very, very tiny. We measure the flux going in, we measure the flux coming out, so we take the flux coming out minus the flux coming in divided by the volume, and that will be the diversion of the electric field at that location. And it doesn't matter what coordinate system we are, we can be in Cartesians, cylindrical, spherical coordinate system, just take a very tiny little volume, figure out how much flux is coming out, how much flux is coming in, take the difference, divide by the volume, and that will give you the diversion of the electric field, which is equal to the change of the electric field as a function of position. At that location is changing this much in the x direction, this much in the y direction, this much in the z direction. To make it simple, we only consider the x direction, but of course if we have a partial function there in the y and the z direction, we need to take the partial derivative of that as well, and it'll have flux going in and out in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction, we add it all up, and that gives you the divergence of the electric field at that point. It gives you how fast the electric field is changing, how much is changing, it's a function of position at that particular location. And that's what we mean by the divergence of the electric field. Now that you understand that, now we'll attack the, attack the second part of the equation, try to figure out what we mean by the charge density and how that relates to a real life example. So I'll show you a couple examples in the next several videos on how to figure out what the entire equation means. Now that we understand the left side equation, let's go figure out what the right side equation means. Okay, stay tuned if you're still interested.